Thank you and a very good evening. Uh, Praveen, if I may request you to uh, open the session with a word of prayer and then we'll continue. Yeah, let's pray. Father, we are so grateful to you, Lord, for giving us such an opportunity to come together to study your word, O Lord. And uh, all these Bible studies have been such a blessing in our lives. And thank you so very much for speaking to us through your servants. Lord, this moment as a group, as your body uh, of your son, Jesus Christ, we come together through the, to thy throne of grace, asking for your special anointing on uh, the teacher so that we may be able to hear your voice, O oh Lord. And you open our hearts and open our minds and open our ears so that we may be able to perceive and receive what you want to communicate to us, O Lord. And the discussion, discussion we are going to uh, indulge in, O Lord, may bring glory to your name. And every word we speak uh, in this platform may be mutually equipping and benefiting to all of us, O God. Lead us and guide us. We submit this hour to thy throne of grace and uh, ask for your special grace upon Sachin as he's going to teach. And your name be exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you and a very good evening, good evening to all of you. I have been out um, for a while because uh, I had to travel um, Sweden for one of the project uh, that went had to go live and I have to support that. And this evening was the very uh, peak of the afternoon there. Uh, but the project was uh, well successful and I'm back here. And now as I back here, I support Sweden and one of the new project uh, in Brazil. So as the evening starts growing, uh, my work starts getting into a peak. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm trying to get adjust with this new kind of work. I always had something that I could very well manage within my working time or plus minus year. This is the first time where it's uh, taking the second part of the day. But I'm excited to, to be back again here uh, to lead and to study the word of God together. And I would like to today uh, lead our session on parables. And if you remember, uh, I also talked uh, in, a, in my WhatsApp message in, and in my previous uh, um, session that it would be good if you can uh, bring along with you any of the modern day parables that you would have received on WhatsApp or you would have read it somewhere or if you would have come across it. Because we'll try and see what we are learning today does it also applies to the modern day parables so let me share my screen set up uh, my screen and everything notes and then we'll start Okay, so today uh, we'll try and learn more about parables. What are they? Origin. We'll try to see why Jesus used uh, parables. How do we interpret uh, parables? And then some of the things that we learn, we'll try to deduce it with some of the modern day parables. So <clears throat> let's start. So one of the most common and characteristics of Jesus teaching is the parable. Now, according to the writer Robert Stain, the author of the book Method and Messages of Jesus Teaching, he says not less than 35% of the teaching in the synoptic gospel is found in the parabolic form. Now, Parables are also an area of some controversy because scholars agree that Jesus taught in parables, but they disagree about how we should go about understanding what these parables mean. Some scholars pare them down to bare minimum and others seek to make the most of it perhaps 
far more than what Jesus had probably intended. So let's see now what is a parable and discussion uh, on a definition. So there is no standard definition for what is parable. The word parable comes from the Greek word parabole. It literally means throwing, uh, that is bole, and alongside that is para. By extension, it also means comparison, illustration, analogy. And it was the name given by Greek uh, rhetoricians to an illustration in the form of a brief functional narrative. Now, uh, parables is also used for various type of figurative language, including riddles and short metaphors. The author Klein Snodgrass, he writes, the Greek word parable has much broader meaning in the gospel than the English word parable. Okay, uh, where's my, yeah. For example, it can be used as a proverb, uh, a riddle, a comparison, a contrast, and both simple and complex stories. Now, this range of meaning derives from the Hebrew word moshal, which is usually, usually translated by parabole. Now, so there is a huge array of what a Bible called parable, but for our study, we will focus on a smaller category. And now, uh, Snodgrass, he suggests that we can uh, call it as stories with two level of meaning and also a parable tell us about a spiritual reality by using physical things or people in the in this world or the sunday school uh, cliche is that parable is an earthly story with heavenly meaning it uses ordinary matters to talk about spiritual realities now several parables starts with the kingdom of God is like. Now, uh, this author, Snodgrass, he lists four basic categories of parable. So, the first is a similitude in which the spiritual reality is specifically said to be like something else. You know, so it's always compared to a scenario which is like something else. The second part is an example story, which gives us a person we can imitate, such as a persistent widow or a good Samaritan. Then the third category he says is an extended metaphor. It is an implied comparison referring to a fictional event or event narrated in the past time to express a moral truth. And the fourth category, he says, is there is an allegory that is a more complex story in which multiple elements are designed to correspond to the spiritual reality. Now, an allegory is a story that uses extensive amount of symbolism. It is similar to a parable, but generally has a greater degree of correspondence that is most or many of the details in a story represent something to carry uh, some specific nuance of meaning. This allegory is a literary technique. So now having understood uh, what is a parable, what different categories of parable, let's now study why did Jesus use parables? Yeah. So now, the disciple asked Jesus, why do you speak to them in parables? And he said, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables in order that they may indeed look, but not perceive and may indeed listen, but not understand so that they may not turn again and be forgiven quoting from mark uh, this is from mark chapter 4 verse 11 to 12 
Jesus quoting from Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9 and 10. Now this make it look like Jesus told parables because he didn't want people to understand. And even more of a surprise, he didn't want them to repent and be forgiven. Now both this part looks little odd because we know and Jesus told us that he has come to call sinners to repentance. As we read it in Mark chapter 2 verse 17, you also read it in Luke chapter 5 verse 32. Now the first part also seem odds for the following reason. Now we are, we are trying to deduce uh, this section. So now the first thing uh, it is that parables were not the only method that Jesus used to teach. He also taught in dialogues, short saying and sermons. But his parables were no more mysteries than his other form of teaching. Many people like to hear him teach, which implies that they understood something from him. But yet he was frequently misunderstood. If Jesus didn't want the people to understand, then what was the point of teaching them all? So which means this probably is not a literal meaning of it. The second point is some of Jesus' parables were understood by people who weren't even disciples as we read it in Mark chapter 12 verse 12. Third reason is that the disciples didn't understand the parables either. They didn't understand the plainest of speech according to Mark. No matter how clear things are worded, uh, people won't understand spiritual truth unless the Holy Spirit enables them. So it wouldn't matter whether he spoke in parable or in simple statement. So that's another uh, reason uh, which contrasts to what we literally make out of it. Uh, one second, hold on, please. Aiga, hold on, please. Sorry about that. We are struggling to make my mother listen and she is not buying a device either. So, so I have to tell her. Okay, the fourth point. Sometime his explanation, Jesus' explanation is just as mysterious as the parables are. But it hadn't been published for everyone. The reason for keeping it quite apparently didn't exist after his resurrection. Probably when... Uh, uh, when he was telling that time it looked like secret but now after his resurrection we can see it all together so scholars are not sure what mark is getting at most of them end up saying that non comprehension was the result of the parables rather than the purpose let me repeat non comprehension was the result of the parables rather than the purpose even then, we have to acknowledge that Mark chapter 4 verse 11 and 12 is only the partial answer. Some of the people did understood some of the time. And indeed, this is what the, what the parable of sower says. Some people understood and others don't. So Jesus spoke in parables so that people some of the people wouldn't understand or they would have an excuse of ignoring what he said. And today, uh, after I finish uh, parables, we will come back to this section and this statement and we'll discuss about it. Jesus spoke in parables, par parables so that some of the people wouldn't understand or they would have an excuse of ignoring what he said. So just remember this um, uh, and then we'll come. So, Bible scholars didn't like to admit it, but we don't necessarily understand the parables either. People have been debating the meaning for centuries. Maybe the purpose of the parable is to provoke thought, not to provide answers. Now, Stain says, 
the parables are not self evident illustration they were never meant to be let me change my slide i have forgot the um, pointers to put in my notes today so yeah so yeah <clears throat> So the parables uh, are not self-evident illustration. They were never meant to be. Uh, Bailey and Van der Broek, he writes, uh, they are often, uh, again, I missed on my notes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, illustration, they never meant to be. And then, yeah. Uh, Bailey and Van der Broek, another author, they write, the parables are open-ended often without a clear conclusion and they build on the anticipated judgment made by the hearers now maybe the answer of jesus is also in the same category it provokes thought about the purpose of the parable rather than providing an answer now jesus response is as puzzling as his parables are People have struggled to understand how this is true. There is no answer that everyone can agree on. Because parable provokes uh, thought because they do not teach ordinary principles. And, and, and let me explain you. The stories often have odd and unexpected elements in which people do things in an exaggerated way or even do the opposite of what most people would do. Now, parables may hold a dishonest person as a good example, or talk about conversation between heaven and hell, or talk as if God assigns angel to torture people. Now, they start out with a normal setting, but usually have a twist. But there is a point in telling, and there is no point in telling a complete normal story. Now, so, Snodgrass, the same author says, often the parables require a reversal in one's thinking. It needs a reversal in the way we think. Now, the author Bailey and Van der Broek, they write, a parable begins by offering the hearer a picture world that appears familiar and typical. And if you take a pause, and if you just remember the parable, you will see, yes, that's how it starts. Something that we know, a farmer, a, a owner, uh, it, it's, it's a field. So the familiar world. Now what happens? The familiar world, which is established at the start, however, is shattered by the means of hyperbole, exaggeration of some strange feature. In this way, the parable evoke a new vision of reality for the hearers. They shake up the world as we know it. And if we are really hearing the parable, we might sense deep resistance in ourselves to its profound challenge to the fortified areas of our life. That's what how uh, the author Bailey and Van der Broek summarize. Now the parables are stories and stories do not communicate truth in the same way the statements do. The parables are stories and stories do not communicate truth in the same way the statements do. It is one thing to say it is good to help people in need. It is another to tell the story of someone who did it, for example, a good Samaritan, even though all social customs were against it. Now, the author Klein et al, he writes, Parable creates an impact through their choice of imaginary and narrative form, which is largely lost when one tries to communicate their meaning with one or more propositions. So we understand parables. But why did Jesus tell parables? Now the author Robert Stain, he gives three reasons. Let's see. The first one sometimes to hide the meaning by the use of parables jesus made it more difficult for his opponents to bring accusation against him but this is not the complete answer for he sometime also we know he explained the parables 
second reason is because he wanted to make a point for example he told about the good samaritan because he wanted to answer the question who is my neighbor and the third possible reason for jesus use of parable may be to disarm his listeners to disarm his listener let me explain now the famous uh, parable of nathan as we read it in second samuel chapter 12 verse 1 about the poor man's eve lamb is a perfect old testament example for this use of a parable now in a similar way the parable of jesus often disarm, disarmed his opponents so that frequently they listen to him without raising a shield of defense so the the, the, the listeners they start hearing they are not realizing what's happening. So their, their shields of defense are down. Only to find out too late that the parable was in effect directed towards them. And such example we see it in uh, Mark chapter 12 uh, in the parable verse 1 to 11 and 16. Now even though we consider the words of Jesus authoritative, it is difficult to use the parables as doctrinal proof when there are different interpretation of the same parable. Let me repeat that. Even though we consider the parables are the words of Jesus and they are authoritative, but it is difficult to use the parable as a doctrinal proof because there are different interpretation available of the same parable. For doctrinal proof, we need doctrinal statements. But for making those points stick in people's mind, it is helpful to have stories that engage the listener's imagination. To engage the listener's imagination. Now a parable is like a proverb. Can have many uh, more than one meaning depending on probably with some variations. Uh, or Jesus would have used the same story to emphasize one point on one occasion and a different point on different occasion like the for example the parable of a lost sheep could refer to a non-christian on one occasion and a wayward christian on another so when we are looking at a parable we need to pay attention to the context that each gospel puts in it so when we are looking at a parable we need to pay close attention to the context that each gospel puts in it. So that's about parables, how, why Jesus used it. How do we, uh, in this time, interpret the parables? Yeah, how do we do that? Now, scholars used to say that Jesus, each of Jesus' parables make only one point. Yeah, most of the scholars, they say that parable should make only one point. And they rejected the allegorical approaches of medieval commentators who saw spiritual significance in every detail of a uh, parable. And let me give you an example. Now, the example is uh, Augustine's uh, interpretation of a parable of a good Samaritan uh, shared in Luke chapter 10, verse 32, 37 in which virtually every item was given a theological significance and walk with me the man is an adam according to augustine interpretation of this parable jerusalem is a heavenly city jericho is the moon um, which stands for a morality the robbers are the devil and his angels who strip the man of his immorality and beat him by persuading him to sin. The priest and the Levite are the priesthood and the ministry of the Old Testament. The good Samaritan is Christ. The binding of the wound is the restraint of the sin. The oil and wine are the comfort of hope and encouragement to work. The animal is the incarnation. The inn is the church. The next day is after the resurrection of Christ. The innkeeper is Apostle Paul. And the two denarii 
uh, are the two commandments of love or the promise of this life and that which is to come. Now, just imagine, this was too much uncontrolled speculation for the scholars. So what they did? Some rejected all allegory and said that a parable must have only one point. Parable must have only one point. But the problem here is the scholars do not agree on what that one point of each parable should be. So what they did, so some scholars focus on what the parables say about God. Some focus on the kingdom of God, the disciples or the church. Now scholars who stress only one point sometimes manage to combine two or three points in their summary sentences. Let me see my notes. Yeah. So Bloomberg notes that most parables contain three main characters. He, he notes that most of the parable contain three main character uh, or group of character. And so um, he, he suggests, let's go. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm back. Okay. So, okay. So he suggests number one, uh, each parable makes one point per main character. That is usually two or three in each parable. And these main character are most likely uh, elements within the parable to stand for something other than themselves. Thus giving the parable its allegorical nature. The second is the frequent use of contrasting characters, such as that Jesus originally intended it, intended in many of his parables, both a message for his enemy and one for his disciples. The third is each parable looks slightly different depending, depending on which character a given member of its audience identifies with. Let me repeat, each parable looks slightly different depending on which character a given member of its audience identifies with. And the fourth part is the parts of the particular parable most likely to be invested with allegorical import are the two or three main characters, which regularly appears as image of God, his faithful followers and the rebellious in needs of repentance. Now, so a parable may contain a character representing God, one or more group of characters that represent disciple and one or more that represents non-disciples. Now, uh, Bloomberg summarized by saying that these uh, summarize that Jesus has three main topic of interest, the graciousness of God, the demands of discipleship and the dangers of disobedience. Now Strauss uh, goes on and he gives us four basic guidelines for interpretation. And the first one is interpret the parable in the context of Jesus ministry. What does that mean? That's the context the author give us, which means Interpret the parable in the context of Jesus' ministry because that's the context the author gave us. Look what it meant when Jesus gave it. After that, we can consider what it may have meant in the early church, why the writer included the parable in his story. Only then we can start thinking about how to apply it in our different context. Now that's literally uh, how we interpret the Bible, right? We see the intention of the author. Why did he wrote it? What does it meant to the original readers? And after understanding that, we can then uh, try to uh, connect how it can mean to us in our own circumstances. So that's the interpret the parable in the context of Jesus ministry. The second thing he says is, Always keep in mind Jesus' central message of the kingdom of God. Many of the parables are specifically about the kingdom, uh, which will uh, kingdom of God. 
some are not directly about the kingdom but we'll still need to consider them in the context of jesus uh, overreaching theme yeah that is um, overarching theme that was the kingdom of god the third um, guideline for interpretation he gives is be aware of cultural historical and literal allusions jesus often borrowed um, imagery or allusions from the old testament or from his own cultural and historical context recognizing the imaginary is often crucial to the parable's interpretation this is often not evident to us from reading the parable itself commentaries can alert us to the presence of allusions often the meaning of the parable depends on the part of the story uh, that made the point he wanted to make however to notice the unexpected we need a good feel for what normal was in the first century culture so we need to be very aware of cultural historical and the literally allusions during that time the fourth um, interpretation suggestion he gives is seek the primary point of the parable what does that mean although there may be more than one point begin by trying to identify one point around which the others revolve often the point is not theological but practical it's very practical so uh, at the end uh, the author gordon p he writes the point of the story is to be found in the intended response and we need to uh, remember that the major topic of the parables and of jesus teaching in general is about the kingdom of god so now if i have to summarize i have not created a summary uh, slide this time but if you have to quickly summarize we can say that one of jesus most common and characteristic teaching method is the parable we know that there is no standard definition of parable it comes from the greek word parabole which means literally throwing along uh, it covers a array of meaning that means we have saw it uh, can be a riddle it can be a comparison it can be a contrast a small story and a long story we have seen uh, categories of uh, parable which is a similitude which is like something an example story to to us to look uh, connect with somebody an extended metaphor yeah the comparison uh, to bring the moral truth we saw the fourth angle that is an allegory that is symbolism a huge uh, comparison uh, with something then uh, we saw uh, or we dwell a bit on why did jesus use parables why what he meant uh, when he does that then we went on and did the how to interpret the parables for our side so what we did we we used the different approach and we have also seen that scholar says that each parable should mean uh, just one um, outcome or two outcome but we have seen that scholar often um, struggle to put the summary in either one or two so they use as many point in their summary sentences and uh, we have also seen that um, uh, <clears throat> when we see the group of parable, parable we see that each parable makes one point per character we have seen that it has a contrasting characters we have seen that each parable looks slightly different uh, because of the message it conveys and from what angle we are seeing the uh, the parable we have seen that the parable has two or three main characters in order to interpret we have seen that we need to see the cult context uh, when jesus gave those parables we have to see the connect along with the context to what um, was the message of jesus uh, his arch message which is the kingdom of god and then we have to see the cultural historical and uh, literary um, culture during that time and then take it to um, uh, 
bring it to our side. But the end thing is that it needs to trigger the intended response. So let me stop my screen share. Now with that, uh, I know I tried to cover a lot uh, in this, but with those guidelines, if I bring in now uh, a modern day parable, would it be, would it help us to you correlate uh, with what we learn to interpret the parable? Number that, that we'll see when we, uh, some of you will share with us the modern parable. Second, then um, I would also like to now clarify if any one of you have any comments or question on parables. And third, I would also uh, like to um, answer on the query that Pastor Dan raised uh, in our last uh, Bible study session in the book of Matthew when we said the rabbis has formed a different uh, definition of the religion, which basically stopped the uh, the other Jews from practicing Christianity. So I've got the answer for that. So we'll go one by one, but we'll start off with, uh, before we go jump into questions, do you have any modern day parables that you can share? And then we can just try to crisscross through what we read today. Uh, just a clarification now, Sachin, when you say modern day parable, are you referring to stories from today or do we take it out of the Bible? Uh, no, uh, stories from today, uh, an illustration, uh, taking the definition of a parable, an illustration uh, of it. If I, I have one, uh, if I, if I read it, then it will get a, um, you will get a little better idea. Yeah. Is that okay if I share one of the modern day parable that I, that we I have re, uh, received it and something I shared in my course. Okay. So this is how it is. Uh, hold on. Yeah. It's called the parable of the popcorn. And it's about the choice and accountability. So behold, at the time of the harvest, the ears of the corn did bring forth kernel, which had dried and prepared for the pauper's hand. And then it was that the pauper did take the kernels, all that appear alike unto him and applied the oil and the heat. And it came to pass that when the heat was on, I think it would be good if I can share so we all can read as well. Hold on. My screen share. Yeah. Oh, I'll still put it. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. And it came to pass that when the heat was on, some did explode and with promise and did magnify themselves an hundredfold. And some did burst forth with whistles which did both gladden the eye and satisfy the taste of the popper. And likewise, some did pop, but not too much. Behold, they were same that did lie there, and even through the popper's heat was alike unto all. Some did just bask in the oil and keep everything that they had unto themselves. And it came to pass that those which had given to themselves did bring forth much joy and delight to many munchers. But those which kept of the warmth and did not bring forth were only cast into the pail and thought of with hardness and disgust. And thus we see that in the beginning all appear alike, but when the heat is on, some come forth and give all, while other fail their purpose, purpose as shaft and so as to be discarded and forgotten. So the, the end is the stories are the incredible way to bring forth the message. The stories invite the listener into its world, sharing the environment, but still provide the freedom to the listener to draw their conclusion. So this 
is a very uh, what do you say a modern day uh, definition that this particular author tried to bring from from the parable of popcorn where he says stories are an incredible way to bring forth the message the story invites the listener into its world sharing the environment but still provide the freedom to the listener to draw their own conclusion so now if we see that does it give you a freedom first of all to imagine and to draw the conclusion now with that principle uh, and, and some of the things we need if we revisit the parable would it give us a new no i would not say a new interpretation i would not say a different interpretation an enhanced uh, understanding of what perhaps we understood before okay so let's so, so now do you have any such modern day parables or we can go into uh, the q and a i don't know yes sir i don't know if this can be called a parable but what comes to mind is the parable of the tortoise and the hare it's a very common story you know where the, uh, the tortoise and the hare have a race and the hare uh, of course is bragging that how he is fast and so on and so forth and he's so far ahead he says oh i have a lot of time let me rest and then he falls asleep and of course the tortoise crosses him and wins the race so what is the uh, the lesson of this story is that the race is not always to the swift right so i don't know if this is an adequate example that came to mind right yeah and you would also see that uh, a parable is often simplified it it does not have a huge allegory in the terms of like it you would not see a parable in revelation okay. um, it it is a simple simple and uh, oriented towards a uh, end user and that's why we, now when you see the context of the first century the farming the way the things were then you would see uh, when jesus gives the parable where he says the owner gave his farm uh, to the farmers to yield so that time they understood very quickly that yes um, these farmers used to take a contract to run um, and they used to pay uh, to the owner but it this transaction was never so well that the farmers are happy to farm so they always had an animosity so when jesus says uh, the owner sent one of his servant they bait him and send no for us at very time we could see that these people became selfish right because they got all the farm and other thing but when you go into that context then you can see the other side of the story why farmers also be, be, behaved like that but then you see uh, then when it happens over and over again so for them at that point of time it was so quick to connect then sometime when jesus connected the old testament uh, things for us it's difficult unless somebody says he is referring to old testament thing we would then say oh okay he was referring it but there the jews knew it by heart right so the moment jesus starts saying something they know where the story is going but then he he through his parable he had a beauty of bringing it to a different end so that's how sometime going into the first century going into their shoes in that circumstances helps us a lot to understand probably what that could have meant if if i can uh, make a comment uh the you meant you you talked about the intended response now the intended response is what is intended by jesus not intended by i mean i can't uh you know invent my own response jesus wanted a particular response am i right by saying that jesus wanted a particular response and hence he used that parable uh 
Uh, and so it is not left to me to interpret as I like. Am I right by saying that? I'll add a little, uh, and this we could say my view, okay, so that, uh, in fact, I would take it a little more further, because you see, any understanding can come only what the Holy Spirit would reveal us to bring. Okay, and now, so when Jesus intended that response, he didn't left into human ability to bring that response. Imagine if I don't know the grammar, I don't know the language, I don't know anything. Now, what really do you expect me to do? You know, uh, of course, uh, Jesus speaking. Every... So, the, so the role of Holy Spirit was there to make the message go what Jesus intended. So you're right when said, of course, because saying the parable, Jesus had an intention of that would do. And that's why he said, you see, sometime the, the, the Pharisees or something, they'll suddenly boomerang, right? Oh my God, it's on us. So now how does that uh, realization come? The Holy Spirit reveals. But then again, now, how do I respond back? Is my very much choice to, 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 to get into that act. I hope that, um, but that's my view, how I feel together. Yeah, that's helpful, yes. If there are no further questions on the parable, then I want to dwell on the question that uh, Pastor Dan has asked. Of course, the question needed us to... I have one question. Yes, Sadi. I have one question. It is still not <clears throat> very clear as to why uh, Jesus uh, said uh, mentioned these parables to hide its meaning. You know, one, of course, was to provoke uh, them to thinking, you know, and only those who were really serious about, you know, uh, following him or getting to know him more would really exercise their brain and find out what this parable means. And then that would lead one to the other. That could be one reason why he hit the meaning. But uh, is that the only reason? Good. Well, we were I, I, a very good observation and something that I wanted to discuss. Good that you brought it here uh, to get other views because uh, when I was sharing, I got, I think, three to four views that what we make the literal, uh, why did Mark put, we don't know, but what the literal meaning says, how does Jesus other references goes against the literal meaning that we draw from um, that verse 11 and 12, correct? Uh, so we saw that he taught, not that he only uh, preach, uh, shared parables, his parables were understood uh by not only his disciple but by others also so his parables were not all the time had that but at the same time his parables uh were intended for users to respond and some had this thing which i said one second let me just read my notes uh and i wanted to discuss that because i uh i is i am also equally uh what do you say uh thinking of the same thing. Let me just open that. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Uh, this one. No. G, uh, here. He says uh, some. Uh, okay. Yeah. Jesus spoke in parables so that people, uh, some of the people wouldn't understand or they would have an excuse of ignoring what he said. Uh, and this was also uh, compared with uh, the the parable of sowing where it says it was intended for some to understand um i am also uh, thinking what could be its intended meaning because yes some did understood some didn't and and what is the meaning that some could ignore or use the ignorance yes rika yes i think uh, jesus wanted to start the kingdom of god small uh, like he said in the parable, he started as a mustard seed. He wanted to uh, take people who were loyal and who had the eagerness to learn. And so he had just started with 12 people. And then, then they wanted to project it further. So his idea, I think, was to start with people who were really uh, understanding, appreciating, being faithful more than understanding. And that is how the kingdom was to go for, forward. 
So that's why he started like this. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we can also connect that with Pastor Dan, what he said is, um, mm -hmm. he wanted users to have that, that he is intended recipient to have the response, right? And not everybody uh, listen or, or created that response but it's a very different this thing probably i i need to have other view also uh, because we 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 put we establish a principle right jesus intended the response holy spirit created the understanding and the humans uh, then responded or not but some didn't understand what can we draw that as some didn't understood the parable what what conclusion or what understanding can we draw from it no, the question is why didn't Jesus then further explain the parable to the people who didn't understand? <laughs> yeah, and here the author keeps on doing that, right? He provoke uh, this thing. It it was never to uh, what was that? He provokes the users um, audiences response rather than um, rather than explaining what it means. It provoked his which time to time his disciples did. You know what do you mean by that? By the way, you right. Know, after every time they will go and ask you, why do you mean that? that? And some he used to explain. Correct. If I can highlight one point uh, in uh, Mark 4, which you read from, Jesus quotes Isaiah. Right? Yeah. And in Isaiah, if, uh, uh, of course, I've not done a thorough study of, but it almost seems like Jesus, in Isaiah, God is bringing an indictment against the nation, saying that no matter how much I have reached out to you, you have deaf ears, mm -hmm. right? So it almost seems like uh, now God has given them over to punishment. So maybe is, is Jesus intending that these people are so dull of hearing that they will, they deliberately don't understand. And uh, mm -hmm. hence, they will be given over to, you know, uh, I mean, the, the, the fact that he mentions uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, he won't, I mean, he, they, they have no opportunity to repent because of their hard heartedness, not because God doesn't want them to understand. I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering if Jesus quoted Isaiah for that purpose also. Would that be one of the purposes? I'm, not, I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah. I think some of the commentaries mentioned that. That, you know, some of those really hard-hearted people who refuse to really uh, even go into the understanding, it was meant for them that, you know, your ears are so hardened. So from now on, you won't, you know, God has given up on you, that kind of thing. And that's... One of the explanations why, you know, Jesus uh, spoke these parables the way he did. Okay. That makes sense, actually. Mm. Any other comments before we move on to the uh, previous question by Pastor Dan? Okay. So let me share my screen and we really go. Okay, so the question was uh, on on the one of the thing that I talked about is the <clears throat> this statement: the Pharisees had become the dominant group, and if Judaism was to survive, it needed to define itself carefully, lest it de disintegrates again into quarrelling faction. So the rabbis created a form of Judaism uh, that was based on Torah and synagogue rituals rather than the temple and priesthood. And the new definition of Judaism did not have room for the people who believed in Jesus. And one of the questions that uh, Pastor Dan asked, could it be the reason for the other Jews uh, not to uh, uh, or, or hindered them from uh, becoming a believer. 
and i reached out to uh, the good thing about uh, gci or gcs is i reached out to my professor and i said uh, i need your help <laughs> you know <laughs> what does this mean and uh, he is dr mike morrison he he is the best when it comes to new testament this thing and he was glad enough to help me with the explanation and i just put it there so that we all can go together uh, through it because many of the things are i had to read literally as it is so here it is okay so it was the late first century or early century early second century when some jews modified their 18 benedictions used at the start of the synagogue services and changed one of them into a curse on the minim most scholar understand that this refers to nazarians that is the christians so apparently they have some uh, benediction that they do start of the service so presumably someone who was a christian or on the verge of becoming one would not say this curse and the others would even see their lips not moving and the idea was that the people with Christian sympathies would not feel welcome in the synagogues and thus there were, would be a parting of the ways, a phrase that scholars use for separation of Christianity from Judaism. That is one aspect he says, then the second aspect he goes on saying some of this is hypothetical including the date of when it happened how widespread it was and whether this caused a schism or was intended result of a schism that had already taken place okay but uh, he was referring to me but your suggestion is probably correct that the things like this would indoctrinate the jews so that they would not become christians so this is, uh, he explained for the Jews, then he also went on to explain the Gentiles that time who were becoming um, um, Christians, he goes and say, but it is fairly certain that when Judaism redefined itself without the temple being central, the law became central and Christian had quite different views on some of these laws. So by stressing Jewish distinctiveness, that is Sabbath, food, laws, etc. They were automatically creating a barrier that made many Christians unwelcome. He further goes on to say, uh, Gentile Christians were not involved in schism. They were probably separate all along. But as Christianity itself came to be more dominated by Gentiles, a separation from Judaism was going to be reinforced except for various Jewish Christian sect such as Ibunite that didn't fit into their category very well. So it's very hard uh, to get reliable info about these groups and then it further says, yeah, that's it. So that's how he went on to the, the life and the ways of uh, living in the first century and explain. Does that uh, answer your question, Pastor Dan? <laughs> Yes, it's very, very interesting. It almost seems to me that uh, Acts 15 is continuing. In other words, the Jews made it difficult for people to be have the freedom and live like Christians without falling into legalism of food laws and circumcision and you know the other other you know laws. It seemed like the Jews were making it very difficult. So it, it seemed like a continuation. And that's very interesting that they brought in that curse. And uh, Jesus says, you know, we don't curse anyone. And they wanted them to curse. Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks for that, Sachin. I'm, I'm glad that uh, you did some digging in, into that. I think that's it from today. I think we just uh, crossed the time. But next time, uh, we'll continue a survey of the New Testament. Uh, we'll further go into the gospel according to Dr. Luke. Yeah. Right. Uh, then, uh, if there's nothing further, can I request Pastor Dan to end up with a word of prayer? Yeah, certainly. Let's pray. Loving, gracious Father, pleasure once again to be with our brothers and sisters here on this platform. 
thank you for making this available for us where we can continue father to uh, increase in knowledge understanding and of course that our faith is strengthened uh, and sharpened and help us lord as we have heard today that you always intended a response from us uh, when we know and understand and learn and introduce to so many wonderful truths help us lord to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit as he makes us uh, aware of the response that is required and needed. So we just ask that you strengthen our faith so that our response is indeed right. And so we just commit this uh, rest of this day into your hands. We thank you for your blessings. We remember those who are struggling with various issues in their lives, uh, that your loving, gracious presence will be with them and help them through whatever uh, trials that they may be going through. We know that you are a faithful God who will continue to bless and take care of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.